I could see great cinnamon in this. Cinnamon? Cinema. Cinnamon. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> <laughs> Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> It's one fucking hour time. I am Evan Husney, and uh, joined, of course, we got to my left, Tom Fitzgerald's in the house, everybody. Tom? Yo, left side. <laughs> Holding down that left side. Okay. How about the left side? <laughs> you guys on your own. No love for the right side. <laughs> Boo, right side. All right, we got, <clears throat> we got Mr. Marcus Herring, alive and well. How you doing? I got to disagree with that guy on the left there. It's all about the right side tonight. Oh, oh no, he didn't. yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> it's <And> on. <laughs> <laughs> to that far right side, um, we have from the far side over there, we got Joey Izzo. Welcome to the show. First time around the show. Joey, what's going on? Thank you for having me. My favorite show. It's great to be here. I watch every week. So this is bizarre. It's a dream come true. Yeah, it's we're making dream dreams. True. Dreams come true. It was his make a wish. Found, it was your make. It was your make a wish foundation request. Was it not to be? Yeah. <laughs> I'll Holy my illness at the end of the show. We don't really even know you from before this, right? Like you're nope. just a casual viewer who wrote. You wrote us a letter. Your people. parents wrote us a letter. <laughs> That's right. My yeah. mother wrote a ten-page email. No, 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 no. We uh, l- let me let me because uh, uh, let me let me throw down on this because uh, when we had Lars Nilsson on the show, you know, Marcus kind of blew us all away, knowing uh, Lars yeah, for twenty years, I know. which was insane. He be, he dusted you and me easy, right? But on, Joey, on the Lars knowing, very proud of that. Yeah, Joey, I've known you for how long? We're almost at, let's see, do Since the math. 2005? 2005. Right? So we're, 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 we're coming up on 20 years. We're, we're almost there. Yeah. But almost at an anniversary. Yeah. Joey and I uh, worked together at, at, in San Francisco at um, Amoeba Music in the video room, holding that shit down, selling wow. DVDs. And, you know, this is before <laughs> Blu rays. We were selling DVDs. Upper Hate, right? Yeah, Upper, upper Hate. hate. Yep. Oh, oh that was shit. a crazy ass place to work. I probably too. walked by you guys. You know. Oh yeah, I'm sure totally. you did. Yeah. Totally sick. And yeah. and we oh. were we were slinging DVDs, and it was a crazy environment. We have a lot of insane stories about doing that, but we really bonded, right, Joey, over just like liking you know movies like the one we're talking about tonight, <clears throat> but like genre Jeez. films, but also like you and I could like throw down on like some Carl Dreyer and shit, you know, right? Exactly. Just <laughs> yeah. like Mark. Yeah, just like Mark Burchard. <laughs> no, our, it, 100%. Our film taste is that fusion of like Night of the Living Dead, man, but also Igmar fucking Bergman. That was like us, right? So yeah. we're so on that there. Uh, board chart wave. And then you guys met Joey much later when he moved to Los Angeles and you're at the theater. Yeah, well, mm-hmm. through, through you, uh, Evan, yeah. essentially. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But still. Yeah, totally. So Joey is here live in the flesh and... Uh, I think we should get to tonight's movie, everybody. Um, uh, one fucking hour, everybody. Of course, this is the show where we talk about one movie for one fucking hour. And uh, tonight's movie, uh, as we mentioned, is uh, for episode 38. We're talking American oh, movie. God. All right, everybody. Here we go. We've done American 38 movie. hours of this crap. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, we're, and, and I must say, uh, trigger warning, we're leaving the late 70s and early 80s. I know. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just, yeah. so our normal know. audience might want to sit this Be one Be prepared. <laughs> it's a different decade entirely. Almost a different <laughs> century. Uh, right. This movie is 1999, right? Isn't that what this is? Yes. Technically? Oh, yeah. I saw okay, it. Okay. I remember it. Clearly, I saw it. Okay. Okay. So 1999, and, American and, movie. Here we go. Joey... Meet the clock. Here it is. Oh Your so, best, worst enemy. Yes. All right. I'll go quick here. My, I first saw this movie in the most likely places. I rented it from my video store. I remember it was in the special interest section, which is probably the best uh, section of the video store next to the horror section. Totally. Um, 
And I would always scour, even at that age, like the special interest section, which was just sort of a catch all of the time for like, you know, sports movies, documentaries, um, kind of behind the scenes stuff, a kind of weird, like grab bag section of the video store. And sticking out of there, you could imagine as a young kid, I mean, I saw it maybe two years after it was released, like around 2001 and I was in high school and I was looking to really expand my horizons. I think at that time, you know, I had caught some of the kind of primer adult stuff like Scorsese and stuff like that. And I was a re real big horror hound. And, you know, I was sort of like an emerging cinephile and, and working my way through. And the special interest section was a part of that, uh, you know, curiosity, young curiosity. And this movie s completely stuck out there because, I mean, it looks like the kind of comedy that I grew up with like these two dudes that kind of like looked like me at the time or like my friends and they're just sort of standing there in this like uh, you know kind of broad title American movie it, it really piqued my interest and I feel like the cover art for the VHS makes it look it primes you for the more comedic aspects though of course we'll talk about that it's not certainly not just that but that was the allures called American movie and it's about this filmmaker and it has these two dudes on the cover that could be a kind of proxy for like dumb and dumber you know like it it sort of had this kind of playful two-hander buddy comedy like sale you know pitch to it and so it was an easy rental and i took it home and it really expanded my universe like that was the first documentary that i really kind of like understood and really personalized for my own like background and interest in making movies so go for joey it. i love you but let me tell the folks what the movie is because you were so Thank eager to, um, out of the gate um what but, is uh, oh <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what is good, uh, Joey Izzo? That was a good, that was a good cold open. That's what it is. No, that, that, yeah, that was a good cold, cold open. Yeah. That was a good cold yeah. open to the synopsis. Um, so, uh, American Movie, everybody, is the intimate and endearing 1999 documentary by Chris Smith that follows Mark Borchart, a kinetically passionate and mulleted Hesher who is stuck in bleak suburban Wisconsin, dreaming of life as a professional film director. With no budget and endless ambition, Mark and his adorable, party way too hardy sidekick, Mike Shank, exhaust all their family, Hi. friends, and resources <laughs> into finishing Mark's singular, micro-budgeted film projects. And I just, before I throw it back to you, Joey, and to anybody else, um, this movie for me, you know, is one that... I absolutely identify with in many, many ways, mainly because I am from the Midwest. I mean, I'm from I'm, I'm from Minneapolis, a suburb of Minneapolis. And, you know, um, Menominee Falls, Wisconsin is a suburb. So, like, I can really, uh, I, like, truly identify uh, with this lifestyle in terms of I grew up around a lot of board charts and shanks, you know, <laughs> people who dreamed of something more beyond their Midwestern isolation because... That part of the world is very isolated. You have the oppressive winters. You have um, you're, you're 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 cut off from a lot of the world. You know you're 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 getting your culture. Would you, you know, say from, that? Uh, not to interrupt you, but just to support. Would you say that if if a person watches Strozik, the Herzog film, <laughs> they would have some idea of what you're describing? Yeah, totally. Like I'm in the kidding. last act. Yeah, no, totally, totally, hundred yeah. percent. Okay, and, and, okay, but okay. but but there is a there is a real um inertia to the midwest when you're when you're when you're from there because it's a huge deal to escape that you know when i when i escaped that and went out to new york and or to los angeles you know you, and anytime you'd come back to visit people kind of looked at you like i can't believe like you you got out there you know somewhere beyond because it's either the booze or the bong that's going to hold you back from getting out of the fucking midwest you know, and that's the, that's the truth, and 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 that is reflected so elegantly, <laughs> shall I say, um, and and hilarious, but also grim a little bit in this movie. And so, for me, when I first saw this, um, you know, I saw it again. It was a big hit around its time. A lot of people were talking about it because it was so entertaining and so um, endearing. You know, and so uh, for me, it made a huge like Mark impression. Mark was on Letterman. Yeah, you know? twice. I'm realizing yeah. it was that big. He was on Letterman. 
Yeah, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. I mean, that was the time when Sundance meant a big, I mean, this was a big Sundance, you know, film and it made a huge splash. And that was a time where that really, you know, sort of meant something. And so for me also, I was an aspiring filmmaker. You know, I wanted to make shit in my backyard and wanted to do that. So I really identified with this movie and and then becoming sort of in my film education, just like you were saying, Joey, it was like, you know, you wanted something more and to kind of get into that special intersection and find out mm-hmm. more about docs and what are really being. And this is a good, big, huge, great time for docs, too. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah I ahead. mean, I, I think I, I pretty much shared my my first entry into this. But before I tell a little bit more about the movie, I'm curious how you guys saw it. Marcus, I, I think everything you're saying about growing up in that area had affected you rings true with me too i grew up in montana right it's snowy it's a little different it's a little bit more northwestern than uh you know than wisconsin but uh northwestern yeah and it's got a lot of the same issues you're talking about too like alcoholism holding people back and yada yada which uh, <clears throat> we're gonna get into but mm-hmm. i think you asked you didn't ask me about that you asked me about what my first experience with this movie is and i think yeah. that i have the rare Experience outside of maybe anyone that li- from where is it Minobi, Wisconsin, <laughs> Menominee <laughs> Falls, Minobi, Minobi Minobi Falls, Mokinobi, o- Odi, Nobi, Kenobi, <laughs> the residents of Moby Kenobi Falls, Wisconsin, <laughs> and me all have the same has something in common, and that we b- all both saw Coven before we saw American. Movie. Yeah, break that down. Excuse <laughs> oh me. I know what it's like, so random, but um. Coven it's, is the movie you know, that based, they're making yeah, in American I saw movie. Co- yeah. Right, right. So, Coven. Yeah, Not Coven. This movie. Coven. Yeah, the movie they're making in the movie. I saw that before, and it's this, I don't know. So it's wow. it's really easy to understand that it's early tape trading, right? Or early tape trading for me. But it was like a tape trade. So yeah, somebody gave me a VHS that had like the Guitar Wolf movie. Ah. Uh, <laughs> The, the 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 video where the guy's like giving directions zero. He's like okay go down to the oh, go the down directions to the grocery guy. store oh, take yeah. a left bam then how about this on, you'll the, see the like country a singer store. bam how and about then, the country singer who hits the guy with the guitar you know that one Hazel Adkins never mind go ahead <laughs> okay I don't know. do you have the same tape yeah everybody had that tape <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but uh, it's like the bam directions guy and then Coven and then I was always like. Why wow. the fuck is this movie on there? You know, I, I didn't know. Wait, what year was this? Those. What were you saying? It must have been the late 90s, you know. So, so it is uh, before American movie played. I, I mean, I don't I Yeah, Possible. I think I was probably like I was wow. in college. And um, so wow. it was like 99, 2000, 98, 90, 2000. Oh, because oh, I'm there, just thinking so. COVID might have been added because... It's, American. It, maybe that person knew about it, but I didn't know about it. So I just watched. There's just this like weird 16 millimeter black and white horror movie stuck on there that wasn't particularly <laughs> great. You know, I just didn't know the context. I'm jealous of you. For so that. when I yeah. saw the movie later, I was like, "Holy shit! This is why that movie yeah. was on that tape." You know, it's like, as if uh, someone made a feature documentary about the guy giving the directions. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. like, well, I think they did. I think Which they, they should if they have a, yeah, or like Winnebago Man. Too. Yeah, when, yeah, Winnebago. right, right. But I mean, like yeah. this is a high. Uh, yeah, so I. Anyway. I didn't really. Uh, the other thing, I, I avoided this movie for a while because I was like, sort of, which we'll also get into. Like, I was sort of like, I thought the world had, had enough quirky docs by then, you know, har har. But um, and I also thought like another movie with the word American in the title. You know, it's like you got American Gigolo, American Tale, American Ninja, American Psycho, and I thought American movie. Well, that's surely the last movie title with the word American in it. <laughs> You know, but then it's just like sniper, oh, American hustle, Pie, buddy, gangster, American Pie, Pie, Pie. Ooh, yeah, Ultra, begun. History yeah. X. You know, it's like, right. <laughs> you're right. right. Beauty, well, American yeah. Beauty, eh? Beauty, right? <laughs> Tom, your, your your origin story with uh, this movie, I I'm familiar with, but I think it, it pairs better with a a, a, a subject we want to cover later in the yeah, hour. totally. <clears throat> but I'll so, just I'll give a teaser. <laughs> sure. That. Uh, I'm a guy who I've never been in the Midwest, uh, really, until years later. Oh. And uh, I saw this film premiering in Manhattan wow. at the Film Forum. So I saw it in a very different context completely. <laughs> and yeah. we can get into that. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. And we definitely will. And so, but, but Joey, um, you know, th- th- this movie I know has a pretty wild kind of chance encounter origin story in terms of how it came together. Let's sort of get into like, you know, Chris Smith, the director of the movie, how this movie mm-hmm. sort of came to be. And then I want to just spend a lot of time talking about Mark Borchardt, but take it away. All right. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think Chris Smith is, it's interesting because I, th- in a way he sort of is is eclipsed from the movie there's so much to talk about with mark and the characters it's odd that such a a famous movie the filmmaker behind the the film you know is sort of like unknown and yeah, really yeah. wasn't a part of the pub, uh, publicity tour like Good at point. all you know and so but you know it really starts with another american movie called american job which was Christmas right. first movie and I think it's important and I'll try and be quick about this because I, I love American job it's a, it's an incredible indie narrative from the uh, from 94 and it went to Sundance but he made this with a friend who made a zine called American job based on his trials and tribulations and like you know uh, real like kind of like fast food work and his trials and tribulations as a janitor and he basically shot on 60 millimeter uh, a film where they would reenact his hirings at these jobs and firings at these jobs and so it's a fictional film but it's based on this guy's it's incredible you would love it and and all of the stories were documented in this zine oh i do have copies of hard copies bitch yeah, wow. so he, he basically took the zine, <laughs> took the guy that wrote the zine and made a movie out of it, goes to Sundance. Right after Sundance, he's being asked, what's his next uh, narrative feature, you know? And so he's working on a narrative film. And while he was working on American Job, putting final touches post Sundance, he hears all this commotion. He's working on it at the Milwaukee uh, University. Because he's basement. from there, right? He's from He's there. from Milwaukee yeah. okay. and he was so they're both from the same area and so he so Chris Smith is also a Milwaukee uh, resident and is and is actually teaching like a kind of assistant professorship kind of job there at the time and Mark is getting in on the sly after hours like he signs up for a course never tens but just signs up to use the facilities awesome. to you know edit his movies yeah to edit so, and have his children sleep over I, in the edit exactly too. yeah exactly the best shit ever it is and the so best. chris chris smith is putting up finishing touches on american job and he hears these guys getting drunk and high in the next room oh, curiosity wow. leads him just down the hall and there's you know and and there's mark editing his film and he ingratiates him, uh, himself to him. And, and I think it's important to know that he never really, that this movie really materialized naturally, like kind of a, out of a series of events. It wasn't a master plan of exploitation to capture right. this or that. It was a guy that was curious about another guy and knocks on his door. Yeah. And guy then, down the hall. Yeah. That's all. And, yeah. and then it was actually supposed to be just a short film because Mark had intentions of going to the Toronto Film Festival and trying to raise money. And so Chris <laughs> Smith thought he was just going to do a little tour short film going with Mark and his family unsuccessfully to raise money. It turned out to be unsuccessful, but goes to Toronto with him. But then he just gets hooked into Mark's life and two and and he spends two years and accumulates 70 hours of material (coughs) out of that. Two years. Yeah. So he spends two years with this person. Another, if you're trying to exploit somebody, there's easier ways of going about yeah. it than spending yeah, two yeah, years. Yeah. Look, you, you, know, you know where you had me regarding, like, is it exploitative? You had me at, like, um, they lived in the same area, and, like, they Dude, were literally yeah. down the hall. It wasn't like, like, imagine if it was, like, some gross British guy or something. Oh, you know, exactly. Like helicoptering yeah. down, you know. <laughs> you know, who's that guy? Mike M- Bloomfield, what's his name? Oh, uh, Nick Broomfield. Nick, Nick, yeah. Nick yeah. Broomfield. Yeah. No, yeah. I don't have a problem with him, but I'm just saying – that sounds like the kind of thing well, that bums yeah. me out. And they're they're both broke at the exact same time, and Chris Smith I'm doesn't sure. have enough money to develop the film. So over two years, he's just shooting and it's just amazing. swirling it away. So he's making a fi- he's broke, making a film about a guy who's broke making a film. That's amazing. Exactly. That's Great. amazing. Great energy that. there. And I'm sure he's finding a lot of, you know, commonality and, and things, you know, yeah, in that yeah, regard, yeah. too. Similar and, age, I'm sure, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chris was and, 25 and he was 29. Mark was 25. Wow. Okay. Amazing. And wow. I think, too, that with Mark, I mean, being 
you know, I mean, somebody who just, I, I would imagine if, if you were to walk down a hallway, knock on a door and Mark was on the other side of that door, like <laughs> he would immediately, he would immediately fascinate, capture your attention and you want to know more about yeah. what's going on, you know, with this guy. Cause he's such a wild, big personality. <laughs> and, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I think yeah, he's got a he, great look, you know, oh, and I'm not mocking fashion like, icon. like, well, I guess, what, yeah, totally. I, I'm saying he like, he like has more. a look. Like, you know, he's doing his damn thing, you know, totally. and uh, he wears it well. Marcus? I always felt like there was some um, that maybe, you know, the idea to like follow a quirky character around was like, you know, it's definitely part of the zeitgeist by that point for a documentary, you know, and like, um, I always felt like that that Crumb was like an inspiration for this film yeah. in a way, like Terry's oh. wig off and, and even like the Errol Morris ones where it's like, uh, uh, Mr. Death, you know, where like you're kind of following around or Vernon it Florida. Feels like, kind of. I'm Florida, not saying, yeah. yeah, exactly. I don't feel like, yes, I don't think it's a ripoff, but I feel like it's in that genre and that Chris must have been informed by it. And like even now, watching it, I didn't realize the first time that I was watching it that I'm watching like a, it's like on film, it's not shot on you know, yeah. TV or whatever, you know, so mm-hmm. it feels of that era even more now it feels even more like a crumb or something um i think initially that's why i was one of the reasons i was like not so interested in it because i thought like oh another quirky movie like you said exploitative I, I was worried about those things but i think when you watch the film it erases a lot of that you know but well, not, mm-hmm. not even a criticism but just sort of like yeah. uh, you know um, uh, looking at like where this sort of film comes yeah from. i got you and and i think you know like yeah crumb is 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 huge and, and I think it shares a lot with Crumb in, in the idea that, you know, you're following an artist, you're getting inside his head, you know, and you're getting into that malaise, you know, and you're also meeting members of the family. And then that's interesting. You're sort of yeah. seeing the area surrounding that person and what shapes that person and how they came into this world and, you know, what sort of Absolutely. events in their family led them and to all what the, they do. Uh, and all the ugly warts exposed, you know. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. yeah. Crumb could have had like a puff piece thing where he just was mm-hmm. all cool and sexy and like, you know, right. like hate no. street and everything, right. but it's right. like his, his brother is just like that's crushing shit. You totally. know, some of the hardest yeah. shit in the world. And removing yeah. the, right. yourself as the director from it too, right? Because there was yeah. that trend, like you said, about Nick Broomfield and like to Roger, be a part of it. Yeah, or, yeah, Roger Mead yeah. stuff like yeah. Gonzo, and then, an extension of Gonzo journalism. Yeah, if I so yeah. documentary, you know, documentary. yeah. It, sorry, if I can, unless Joey, you had something else you wanted to add onto that. I, I was, I wanted to talk, start talking just about about the filmmaking quality of this, what I think really elevates it. But did you have something else you wanted to say? One more thing, and it might dovetail into this, but just to say that like I was, you know, I was going to film school shortly after this movie and it was a a top of mind movie and that it was San Francisco state and they were very into documentary and experimental film. And based on my experience being in film school, that was really documentary focused and also paying attention to articles about this movie at the time. I have to say that there, even though the movie was wildly successful with, with, with a mainstream audience, which is also sort of a rarity for documentaries, like, True. you know, even of that time, sure. people, the, the, the kind of professors and the mainstay documentarians did not want to embrace this movie. It was a bridge too far into entertainment land. And I yeah. think that there's maybe even in hindsight, I find that their arguments to be somewhat superficial and, yeah. and don't really hold water in the way that the movie was made. And maybe aesthetically as, as, what you're about to talk about or like the the filmmaking yes but i think yeah. the humor how entertaining a movie can be how much narrative it can yeah, get out well that was intimidating from for documentarians at the time oh totally well there's gate there's a lot of gatekeeping happening with yeah. uh the avant-garde and all that stuff exactly they thought if like one thing sneaks a toe in like this and it's actually god forbid entertaining then you know suddenly everything's ruined you know well i want to say yeah it's very I, I baby definitely... boomer. <laughs> well, I definitely, <clears throat> I definitely want to get on that because one thing that really struck me watching this movie again, um, and I've seen this movie, it's up there with movies I've seen the most. You've seen it um, twice, right? Like, <laughs> no, no, no. A couple times. No, a, oh, more. A, oh, okay. Not really, I'm like, like big five zero or something, like nearing semi-co- 50? Semi-cosplaying as Mark Borchardt. Um, okay, so... Um, <sighs> To me, this movie, when I like watching it again and want, you know, like I, I, I said it earlier, but I truly mean it. Like I, I really think the movie is pretty elegantly made, you know, in terms of yeah. 
like even though it's dealing with dirt bags heavy metal guys acid burnout guys you know a a, mm-hmm. a kind of 16 millimeter gritty horror film you know and also like you know suburban squalor you know even though it's dealing with all those things it, it, it has this lightness to it in terms of the way that it's made and like it's constructed. And one of the things that really jumped out at me, and I think this is why it works so well, is because, you know, the film, I mean, because, you know, look, you're, you're following a guy or a set of people for two years, right? It's a lot of footage. It's a lot of possibilities for how you could string this movie along, right? Yeah. And, 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 and one thing for me that, that, that really works for it, and I think why a big audience loved it, is that he would just capture these humorous or 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 dark uh, like idiosyncratic exchanges and moments between all the characters in the movie, and then he's using those pieces just to construct the thread of the uh, like of the of the narrative of the movie. So if you take a step mm-hmm. back, the whole movie is just built is just built uh, with these little idiosyncratic moments the whole thing is just moment 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 like we said before the editing room uh, sleepover right exactly mm-hmm. or just any mm-hmm. of the exchanges if you just watch it it's just yeah. like any of these moments in the film there's too many to name but that's what's kind of bridging the narrative of this entire film and he's able to communicate exactly what's happening in mark's life and with the making of the movie just out of little idiosyncratic moments and i think that that's it's what's really remarkable. unique about it yeah, I, yeah. Hear, I hear yeah that is what I, makes I, a lot of yeah go ahead Oh, I, I was just going to say to that point that, you know, I, I rewatched some of the deleted scenes, which most are available on oh, YouTube. Shit. I gotta and there's that. some incredible stuff. But one thing I, I that came to mind while I was watching it was like, man, if this guy really wanted to make like a hit piece or really want to pull Mark's pants down, yeah. he had the footage. He had it and he cut it out. You know, there's a lot more severe alcoholism that is on the cutting oh, yeah. floor. There's a lot more Definitely. embarrassing shit. Definitely. And he cut it out. And I think that, like, as everyone's was saying, I think we skip through Mark's life and get a sense, an impression of things that feel authentic. There's nothing that he's leaving out like, I don't want them to know this about, about Mark. I don't want the audience to know this. But he mm-hmm. gives just enough to allow us to yeah. draw kind of our own conclusions. It's and not gratuitous. It. Yeah. It's not gratuitous in, in over-depicting, you know, the guy's maladies. And I think that's a testament to how he did not have an exploitative um, perspective in making the film and a portrayal of this guy. I got to say one thing too, it's like the emotionality of it. It's like, like what the film to me doesn't read is just like, it's a comedy. Like, look at these bozos over here. Mm -hmm. It's like the, 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 the opening for me when I rewatched it is uh, the friendship between Mike and Mark and how it's pretty sweet and they really do love and depend on each other. Yes. And um, there, that's a real friendship. And this guy, Mark, needs that, <laughs> like a person in that, because I was thinking, like, when you're asking your mom and then, like, your kid to, like, press the, you know, the camera buttons and stuff, it's like, you're kind of pretty much alone, but yeah. at least he has Mark. At least he has yeah. Mike, and Mike has yeah. Mark, you know? And Mike's and always so there. That, yeah, he's always there. Yeah, exactly. Right. And he'll always be there. And it's, it's kind of beautiful in a way. And that's when I, the whole film kind of collapsed for me as far as just being, like, a piss take on, like, a bunch of hosers, like, you know? It's not like, you know, uh, what is it? Um, Strange Brew, <laughs> those guys. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, I just want to make yeah. that observation that, um, I mean, it's not, I'm not over, I don't want to overdo it and make it say, say it sound like it's not funny. And these guys do come off pretty foolishly a lot, you know, especially Mike. But it's okay because they're, they're, they are humanized. I got human yeah. beings out of the That's who they portrayal. Are. Yeah, yeah Marcus. That, that is I think part of that is from the way it's structured, you know, like they like you mentioned like how it's all little bits and pieces, but the way the movie like unfolds too is very nice. Like I think cuz it's like it has funny moments and then you you introduce this really charismatic character who like uh Tom's always talking about people that are like centers and like you know uh the universe sort of like gathers around them, you know, and Mark is one of those people who's got like Yeah. You know, it's not just Mike, whatever, you know, all kinds of friends and stuff helping him out and like being a part of his world, you know, because he is charismatic, even though if, if he is like goofy at times or has like problems in life. But I think like you see those problems are teased out, like, or like they're, they're not teased out, but they're introduced later. Like you, you have this, like he's funny, uh, he's charismatic. Oh, oh, he knows about film, you know, like, mm-hmm. oh, he's got kids. Oh, he's got a drinking problem, you know, like, yeah, you know, right. It's mm-hmm. The way it's like unfolds to the movie is done so mama. well 
Yeah. You can a baby. Yep. You spend so much time with like it could they could a bad per, a person tells a bad story by going like there's this guy named Mar. He's got an alcohol problem. He's making a movie. You know they give yeah, all the nice. deals at the front, but he yeah. like really threads it through. It's like it's he breadcrumbs it out. Yeah. Yeah, breadcrumbs it out. It's like good old fashioned storytelling. You know, keep the audience engaged and interested. Yeah. And I think that's yeah. a big part. Well, and what he's doing is slowly the filmmaker is like making a sculpture of an actual human being. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And like, 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 and when it's done, you can stand back, you know, and go, yeah. oh, I was looking at a human being. When yeah. You're making the ears and shit, you know, in the sculpture. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. So, well, Mark, if I can, just real quick, just to have a little section on Mark here. Um, you know, <clears throat> he's such a um, one of a kind kind of guy, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one thing that is, is, it's amazing. I mean, you, it's just like you can't write you know, Mark Borchart dialogue or a character like that. We've got madmen putting scarecrows up front. God knows why. They have no pragmatic purpose to the show, but I'd like to keep the troops motivated. Uh, idle hands are known to be the devil's workshop. You know, um, but his who he is is just on the surface so funny. I mean, it's hard not to laugh at everything that comes out of his mouth, you know, because it's so endearing. And it's like mm-hmm. that sort of likable... <laughs> intellectually pretentious but also dirtbag metalhead guy is mm-hmm. such a yeah, um, familiar quality with that too right yeah yes well yes of course but it's just like that character you know is so f- just inherently you know funny in the fact that like you know he has such a wide vocabulary like he looks well, the he, way he does like he looks you know, like, like when he when he yeah. name drops manhattan just to speak yeah. to what you're saying flesh <laughs> yeah. it out you ever see manhattan you ever see uh, the Seventh Seal where they have these great dialogues with these great backgrounds? Yeah. You know, talking about the plague and there's a gargoyle in the back, or talking about life and there's Jupiter, or Saturn in the back. It's like he says, like you know, like the guys. I'm paraphrasing. The guy's head explodes in Dawn of the Dead, or like when they're talking in Manhattan at the planetarium. And I was like, excuse me, <laughs> like what? Yeah. And it's just, I love that because he does consider. Yeah, right. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> but he just considers himself, you know, like. Uh, you know, I'm a student, study a student film, you know, like, and um, but it is all very endearing. That's a good word for it. Something yeah, and, that, that's funny to us as Americans, it's like, it's like Kenny Powers a little bit too, where there's a guy who's like, mm. you know, you would, who would be kind of, you know, to a certain crowd would be dumb, but he's got like a depth and like an understanding of like art that's deeper than you would expect. Yeah, he's well read. He's really yeah, well was, read. <laughs> yeah. You could he's tell he's like Proust and he re- he's yeah. the interesting the interesting right. thing about Mark, I mean like he seems like a, a character I've I've met before in my life and you know oh, yeah. conversations yeah. I've I've had drunkenly with friends, but there's also just something so idiosyncratic and some of that is based on just like he's a has a weird background like he didn't watch television ever growing up and uh-huh. and he pretty much like reads all the time and he loves theater and you know he goes Whoa. to the cinemas like he doesn't yeah. even watch movies on tape like at home or anything like oh, that okay. like too often he's super so pure he's, he's living this pure weird yeah. life that's just his own and that's a real special yeah kind of per, uh person you know to capture. Yeah, yeah yeah and 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 it's amazing just yeah because being well read like the fact that it's just it's just that like funny combination of a guy you know who looks like for lack of a better term, like sort of an Iron Maiden roadie, you know, kind of guy, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> or, or, or like April uh, wine roadie, maybe yeah, more. There you go. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant. Yeah. A- April wine roadie, um, you know, kind of guy that we all like heavy metal parking lot kind of dude. Mm-hmm. And then, but at the mm-hmm. same time, you know, he's all about Bergman. He's well read. His vocabulary is very extensive and he loves using it. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 but then the other end of that is that even though he may lack sort of conventional, uh, a conventional sense of talent, artistic talent, even though I think Coven's dope and I think it looks awesome, I'm just saying oh, yeah. he makes up for it in that sort of like just raw confidence. Uh, to the point where he could be an excellent salesman, like he could sell you your fucking yeah, pen, like, 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 mm-hmm. like it's well, nothing. Well, he got Uncle. He got Uncle Bill to sign on the dotted line. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, right. right? Yeah. Uh, another one of the He's colorful got, characters in the movie. We're, we're going to have to, we got to do like a half hour on Uncle Bill. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Marcus. Right. Okay. So. I just want to say, Mark, I'm going to spell it out. And he's like such an authentic personality. And I think it's like, I hear that word get tossed around so much these days, like at my job. And some people talk, praise someone's authenticity. And they're basically talking about like a teenage. Ryan Seacrest type character or something is like, 
what like this influencer person, or something yeah exactly oh. like oh he's so an influencer is like authentic and it's like what i mean this guy is like no there's there's a lot of people that even pose in this sort of maybe we'll get into this later but like in this sort of dirt head thing later on you know like that are always putting on airs or whatever but he this guy is just like i don't know everything about oh, no. it's so authentic and it's he's like, the real like, deal what you yeah. see is what you get can if i can interject just something you guys i think will appreciate this is i'm just realizing that who he reminds me of in a lot of ways is the guy who made last house on dead end street uh-huh. <laughs> and you guys are familiar with that and oh, yeah. those out there if you haven't you should immediately see last house on dead end street uh because it's, it's really similar right yeah, yeah sure <laughs> everything's different <laughs> but like i'm saying like um not to change the topic of, of the show but just like um it's someone who put it you know he's like he's got no resources he's got nothing he's yeah. like i guess i'll star in the movie you know what yeah. i mean it's that kind of it's like uh I just i don't have any other resources and so so last house yes but i'm saying to my point is um what kind of gets me annoyed uh and, and, and wants to support people from like a blue collar background is don't judge them asshole <laughs> because you went to like sarah lawrence college because it's about resources you know what i mean this mm-hmm. guy is not going to sarah lawrence he never did and never will and um he doesn't have money and he doesn't have uh, any kind of connections to culture you know his, his father didn't write for the new yorker and it's just like Anyone, everyone who has that background, just full stop, shut the fuck up about a guy like that because it's about resources on a material level. I mean, he didn't. And also, how about this? He had to throw newspapers at six in the morning to make a living, you know, while you would be able to like sleep yeah. in, you know, and, and, you know, read uh, Chaucer or something like that. So it's like, <laughs> that's what I do get. A, I do get a little, def- you know, like my back against the wall about that kind of thing. Like, you have to understand this guy's coming from a context. Meaning that I think he might be one of many people out there who, you know, like, uh, what do they say? Like, God distributes talent evenly, race, gender, everything. But resources are not distributed evenly right. at all. Right. You know? And that's reflected so here I in this movie. Well, he just needs to work so. harder and pull himself up by his. Because he has to. <laughs> because it's in him and he wants to, like, express something and he's got things on his fucking mind and he yeah. can't just go, well, you know, it'll call some friends and we'll do this HBO pilot and see how it goes, you know. <laughs> so just saying, you know, yeah. that whatever like like this guy's maladies are, you know, and even his drunkenness can be attributed to a general bitterness and frustration in in, in having your yeah. being cut off at the knees. And every bitch ass motherfucking factory worker is gonna go down like that too, bitch motherfucker. Mark, none of that conversation. I, yeah, I don't. Right? I'm here, here, man. I'm with you, and I don't know if there can be a discussion of this movie without talking about the class issues. You know, I don't know if yeah. this is the right time to get into it, but I mean, Let's like, do it. the whole, the whole way that the movie, uh, just its impact on culture too. I think that there are, uh, there's, a, I feel a class struggle watching it. You know, thinking that it played. I don't know if someone wants to pick it up from here, but just. How well, this movie was like playing in the world. Oh, well, that's the you thing. want to get I mean, to that I, right I, now? Well, oh, well, we okay. can. Pa- Why not? Well, what do you think? Okay, well, because that just dovetails into storytelling and stuff. Um, you want to just hit it and I, quit it and do that? Okay, fine, hit it and quit it. But I, I got the clock <laughs> is dying on me, and I have so much well, more. Well, that's the thing. I'm so sorry, Evan. I mean, we won't talk anymore after this. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, no, we're no, going to no. bring it up, so let's just bring it up now. I'll okay. be quick. So, like I said before, breadcrumb to this. I saw this movie on a date. 1999 at the Film Forum, you know, across the street from the Angelica, 14th Street. And guess what? Packed audience. And guess what? They're all sophisticates, urbanites, and they're all dying laughing. I remember there was a roar of laughter, and he's like, I want 20 bucks in the lottery. But you know that we don't. Well, I won $50 on a lottery ticket today, but I don't want them guys to know. And I was kind of like, I was laughing, you know, it was entertaining. But what's weird is that a couple years later, Todd Solondz of Happiness, Welcome to Dollhouse, made a movie called Storytelling. I see storytelling and suddenly I see Mike (laughs) from this film. And I'm like, what? And he's uh, he's helping a documentary get made. And the documentary features a guy named Scooby. He's a dirtbag teenager, dirtbag guy. And he goes and hears of a pre-screening of a rough cut in Manhattan. He goes in, it's a packed audience, and there's a silhouette of all these, guess what? People laughing at the guy Scooby, this teenage dirtbag, saying things like, 
uh, I think I forgot to get high this morning because I was high, you know, and they're dying and they're, and it's just talking about everything we're saying, class, resources, and, and just, uh, you know, and, and being cutting in the way that we look down up, up upon people. And for some reason, Todd Sons decided to pick that fight in the film storytelling and the film in the movie, the documentary in storytelling is called American Scooby. Mm-hmm. It's further reading. I suggest you, yeah. you know, to all the viewers to check it out if you haven't seen it. And- because yeah. that's what Todd Solins is addressing. He had some problems with what he saw. He sniffed out as some kind of um, kind of ill, uh, you know, like urbanites versus everyone else um, snobbery. And I and, think that I think that Todd Solins is sort of and fine for him to do so, but he's sort of conflating the audience, the urban like you know um audience with the filmmaker like as we've discussed like right this movie is actually right. coming from a much yeah. more no, totally. organic place but the 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 hackles must have been up around the kind of um mainstream popularity and how how tickled into the intellects the intellectual audience at at sundance must have been and and yeah. in these like openings in new york and la it played as yeah. a big comedy guys trust me yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, that's what oh, that's how sure. it was digested yeah. nothing else was taken in except like wow that guy with the mustache he is really stupid you know right, yeah. right, and right. i think i, I gotta this. say too i think like what i witnessed too i think was like after that too those same type people would appropriate like his look and sort of in the, the mm-hmm. to like yeah. sort of a dirtbag chic Absolutely. thing that happened, you know, thinking about like trucker hats right. and like well, mullets there was a, and well, there was a whole book about mullets that and, came out right and, then. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of brewing a little bit before, but I think this movie really became like, it really cemented it as like an archetype Absolutely. and a look. Those, those glasses, you know, like that style of like hipster, Dirt yeah, bag sheet I mean, that, how know, much so is like, that return of the living? You know? How much is that return of the living yeah. dead part two shirt? Worth sure. now, five I know, now, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a total, it's a total look, and it's been uh, well, appropriated by like Williamsburg assholes for forever, well, and they still well, do it. What, what <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, just go, going back to where we were, just about the um, sort of idea of like you know his surroundings and the socioeconomic. What's you know that sort of you know in that's real sort of low income areas of suburban Wisconsin there, you know, and, you know, we got to talk about the alcoholism in the movie too, but what's really interesting is when you do look at Mark on face value, the type of movies that he is making, I mean, they are about that surrounding, you know, in terms of the movie Northwestern mm. he wants to make is a big grand epic, you know, about what being is the a, general uh, plot of Northwest Western? Well, if you could help me out. Joey, do you, do you know have any actual, idea? I, Just, I, I, I know have themes. Hit, honestly, Not it's very hard. It's it's actually very similar to Coven. I mean, this gets me in a Uh-oh. kind of bigger thing. I kind of feel like horror hounds ruin American movie for me, and that's partially they ruin everything. because of <laughs> yeah, don't they? Yes. But like, it's partially the movie's fault. I think if there's one misstep, and may, it's maybe just because it's the best fo- uh, uh, footage, but it makes it look like Mark Burchard, and he has that quality. Is just a horror fan is making horror movies but coven Not true. is more yeah. of a psychological thriller what is coven coven's a 35 minute direct market thriller film shot on 16 millimeter black and white reversal uh it's uh an alcoholic man compelled to go to this group meeting by his one and only friend left but they're not that helpful to group we yeah. weird like parts about it because it's about this weird bizarre aa inspired kind of cult group but it's more psychological and, and mid and northwestern feels more like an eagle pinnell movie like uh, the whole oh. shooting match or last night at the album wow. did he ever like make that. it did no. he ever make it no not that i'm so aware it doesn't of it. Exist. Not but that, that was his intention exist. was to make that sort of his, like a portrayal of drunken like a, regional oh wow you know like te, you know dirt and rust he says it's drama. about he says it's about rust you. and dirt or something like that at one point yeah rust you know, bell drama or something, yeah yeah exactly yeah. that's what yeah. It is. it's about yeah, you know yeah. what again just having digested really literally only the film american movie i did just assume that he just you know wants to crank out like you no. know like uh, beheadings and bloodletting all no the time. because that's yeah. like thought, where you i started thinking like it's northwestern because it seemed different because the title's different than a horror film i thought 
Is that also just like a blood fest? Like, no. Sir, it no. I mean, obviously, because like the more the scarier the Super 8 films you see in the in in the movie. Yeah, I mean, that's like how kid, all yeah. that's how all backyard filmmakers start. You do the horror thing mm-hmm. with the blood and the guts Always. and everything. Always. But what's yeah. great about him is that like, and I've seen him speak at Q and As and uh, you know and things like this over the years. And you know, you know, he really is mostly interested in talking about Jean Renoir. Like, he wants to talk to you about you know the. Oh my. the God. Grand illusion more it's than he incredible. wants to talk about, you know, George Romero. So wow. that's really so, where his head is. So at, that's a know? ding on the film, I'd say. But I understand the reality of you got to mm-hmm. like pick a battle and pick your horses and go with it. And this is a more sure. commercial thing. Although mm-hmm. a, a genre war obsessed alcoholic from the it's, Midwest. Uh, yeah, I want to see I that wanna, movie. Hell yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah let's, and let's get into that I too get it. because, Sorry. you know, you know, because I think. You know, just as the, I'm watching the clock here, you know, um, it's terrible. The clock's awful. To me. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is. Really, really let awesome. Evan go because he's going to kill us afterwards if he doesn't get those points. <laughs> he's going to so. COVID us. Evan, take us it. into a oh, you own the show, kitchen Evan. cabinet. No, no, no. I, it, My no, safe word is Uncle Bill, though. Okay, <laughs> okay. But guys, uh, maybe just we could, you know, if, if throw in on this too. But something for this viewing. I mean, if we're sort of covering things that don't get really talked about in this movie that much yeah, is good. just the sort of blatant alcoholism or, or alcohol or booze being at the center of almost everything, you know? And um, it, it, it really is. It's crazy in terms of like, you know, the Midwest and Wisconsin specifically, guys. I found out, I just looked this up, that the top 50 drunkest counties in, in, the, in the U.S., okay, the top 50. Yeah. Uh-huh. Wisconsin holds 41 positions 41. on that list. That's yes. really dysfunctional. Is, aren't there like yeah. dry counties there and stuff? Like, like or is sure. that just Minnesota? I think Minnesota it's maybe Minnesota. Like, yeah, yeah. I, th- I don't know about Wisconsin. I, don't, I doubt it, given this list. But it just goes to show you that it's such a part of the culture there. It's a drinking, you know, winter mm-hmm. culture, you know. And throughout this whole movie, it's like, you know, booze is kind of the thing that gives Mark kind of the energy with the ideas and everything and to probably propel him to doing what it is. But it's also kind of the thing that's holding him back. I mean, he has this incredible ambition. Sure. But at the same time, you know, um, yeah. that is a big part of it. And all of his movies, Coven is about an AA group. And mm-hmm. Northwestern is 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 this booze fueled um, Rust Belt mm-hmm. drama. So it's something that is mm-hmm. part of everything. At the center. I, I felt that one of the most times is like when he's in the basement giving an interview and they're upstairs like shooting and he's drinking. He's like pounding a beer. Yeah, and he's me like, too. Hold on, guys, I got the blankets. You know, I just found yeah, yeah. them or whatever. And like he's oh, yeah. look, look, look. he's tricking them. He's like I noticed them. that yeah, too. That, that was depressing. Sneak yeah. a couple yeah. bottles in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was I mean. Go ahead. No, yeah. I mean, I think that the the alcoholism, <laughs> it's also interesting because, and this is not to excuse it, but it's it's interesting to just point out that the, factually it is capturing a certain two years in this man's life. Because True. after the Thursday, after the Thanksgiving incident of him getting really drunk in front of his family and trying to go to the bar, you know, after the Pacers win the Super Bowl yeah. and stuff like, or the Packers, excuse me. Like, Packers, um, hello. Yeah, excuse yeah. me, but the uh, <laughs> he um, he quit drinking, and and oh, and he yeah. had like a, a momentary relapse. But for the rest of the movie, he w- he was dry, and he's been oh. sober for for many years now. Sober. So, you know, we're catching <laughs> we're catching him in a moment, and and, okay. and it's just important and to if, to know that it's not no idea. all encompassing. And of course, of Mike is sober too. You know, I was, so was going to yeah. say, like, so you're I was having gonna say, both yeah. sides of it. Yeah. That's and, true. And Mike, Mike was and, more and, of a druggie than a boozer, right? Uh, no, vodka. Oh. Vodka. Yeah, oh. lots of vodka. Oh, yeah, yeah that's true. Vodka. Yeah, vodka. we're drinking vodka. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and Mike, yeah. just to give Mike just like a minute or two on the clock here, oh, you Mike know, minute. Mike, oh, Mike shank. minute, one fucking minute on Mike. He is obviously just an incredible... My, I, you know, there's that one he's, scene where Mark he's says... He's the Fonzie of the movie. <laughs> well, he's that... There's like that a breakup one, star. There's that one moment where, like, Mark is, like, you know, even talking about he's having a really depressed day, and Mike shows up and puts a smile on his face, and that's a great moment. Mm-hmm. Illustrated yeah, that's what I was talking about. Friendship. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's like he does that for me, too. It's like anytime I see him in this movie, I instantly have a smile on my face because, you know, but at the same token, you know, you sort of do get a look oh. through into what their, you know, Tolkien, at what their uh, wild years, partying years were probably like because Mike is kind of yeah. the consequence, you know, <laughs> of, of that, mm-hmm. I'm guessing, you yeah. know. Yeah, he got the yeah. full force of uh, whatever they were doing back then. You yeah, know? yeah. He's like uh, kind of stunned and you know, uh, barely uh, 
barely cogent. Um, totally. Cogent. Uh, can, can we cogent? That's why I said that. Can we please talk about Uncle another Bill. MVP in the film? Yeah. It's Uncle Bill time. Clock's killing us. Uh, sorry, Uncle Bill. Actually, I just said Mike's Fonzie, but maybe Uncle Bill is Fonzie. What I mean is a breakout star, like they did, you know, like Schneider and it's an awful show, One Day at a Time. But like, uh, I just have a few notes that I made, and if if you'll indulge me, and then you guys talk about it. But just I have Uncle Bill. This is for the birds. You got to bring oh, passion to it. A message. It's a message. This it's- is the, for the shits and for the birds. <laughs> yeah. or um or uh yeah yeah the cinema cinematic cinema uncle bill uh, cinnamon i see great cinnamon in this cinnamon cinema cinnamon <laughs> dude <laughs> that's what? the best you know so uh, you the know best. he's responding yeah. to, to mark trying to talk about yeah. cinema yeah. so uh he's amazing uh his dead his deadpan reaction everything and it's a very valid perspective that he has like it's not gonna work out i have no faith in you whatsoever he's he's world weary well he's weary of not only the world in general but also of his family and the whole the whole this whole place we're talking about this place you know in the in the country and in the world you know where he's 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 not signing up for any kind of hopes or ambitions uncle bill time uncle bill father time yeah, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's generous with, you know, he does support he's, him, even though he's after, like, you well, know. After a lot of coaxing. After a and lot. To, yeah. And he has to yeah. sign any advance, you know, out of the. Yeah, yeah. Right. I mean, he, left money. He, has, he said he had like 28000 No, he said he had $280,000. Yeah. After yeah. Coven, after he saw Coven be a sellout crowd, did he leave him the money, I think. I think, you know, Mark is the type of guy who needs a Uncle Bill you know, in order to probably keep his drive going. But at the same time, he is the money. If I mean, you know, again, you talk about resources. Like if there was no Uncle Bill in Mark's life, like I don't think any of this shit probably would have happened. None of it would have happened. Yeah, so, sure. Because yeah, I don't think his parents were really yeah. coughing it up too much. I, probably didn't I love that. that they, they cut him off. I love that you don't see him like he's not swindling. At first you think he's like, you can see he's putting the pressure on him. And you feel like yeah, I know what you like mean. he's swindling an old man. But then he's like you know you see like how much he cares for him and you get the feeling that mark is the one that puts in time with him and bathes him and all this he stuff, does you know yeah oh he makes and that's a beautiful moment yeah I, I i totally agree like the that's one of the most interesting relationships that is developed throughout american movie is uncle bill and mark which at first you're suspicious of but then for me i i feel that they are doing this this dance and if i had to guess from uncle bill's perspective maybe this is even intuitive but i think he want he enjoys mark working for it he enjoys like putting speed bumps so that mark appreciates it if he just gives him the money i think he worries about it so i think he's in some ways trying to protect mark and make sure that he really wants this and is committed to it there's there's an element of that i think i think you're right yeah he has to see like you're he's earning it more you know yeah and valuing and, it, more importantly, you know. And of course, Mark's tactics, you know, are so amazing. I mean, one of my favorite moments is when he's really pushing on Uncle Bill, and he's like, "Take the profits." That'll be the day. That'll be the That'll day. That'll be. And you know what? I'm going to bring over a bottle of wine, man. Do you have a preference? That'll be the day. Red or white wine? Mm. Red or white? What kind of wine you like, Bill? Red or white? Red or white wine, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. the best, you know, That's for the most quotable lines. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's sure. also like not a tactic not employed by like mainstream Hollywood. People. Like <laughs> yeah. what you're seeing is like a reduced. Yeah. There's so many elements of this that have mapped. <laughs> I've seen elements of American movie in certain like higher echelons of, of movie industry conversations. And it's like, you're just doing a Mark per chart that, you know, you're overselling your vision to the crew at the first uh, like production. There's all sorts of little moments that are, I think kind of true on a, on a grander scale. Like uh, it's the same kind of mentality. It's like the same way you talk to investor is like, like uncle like bills, similar. the studio. Yeah, yeah, like, totally. And it has exactly. that kind of relationship. That's so interesting. Yeah, you lie to them all the instincts. time. You're like, yeah. You know, I love yeah. how he has those instincts to like, I'm going to paint a picture for you with words uh, right now yeah. to sell. The, you know, he's got those instincts of a, he's pitching a film. If it's in, without if it's between my two hands, I've seen it. I already have it. 
I already yeah. seen you know, it. Yeah, yeah. The line when he's like, I'm going to tell you about why films <laughs> fail. And I'm going to tell you about why films yep. succeed. And I'm going to tell you about a film called Northwestern. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and, and of I course, that line put together. And but yeah. then of course yeah. on the on the flip side of that, you know, there is no <laughs> fucking marketplace for a thirty minute black and white short film. <laughs> you know, like well, I know, know I will say this. Yeah. Let me say this. Okay. hundred percent agree. But Mark created that marketplace because one of the most hilarious oh like fuck this guy has no idea. He's trying to sell three thousand units of a black and white. 30 minute Pregnant, documentary so. uh you know film well this is one of them you know this is the code yeah. oh, oh, this is damn. this is numbered <laughs> hold so it this hold is it number shit. hold it in this front of your face frame, frame. Oh, frame. Right we got to see it oh there you go oh. right there you could do it that's good right, right there right, right there. there so this boom, is boom, number boom. it's numbered up top here you probably can't see it's it so cool this number 3143 so and then i checked <laughs> I checked Check. this is the little detective work I did. I checked the way back machine and tried this because he was doing a number of how many units he sold and he Amazing. got up to over 5,000 VHSs <laughs> sold within two years. Wow. So he figured it out. You Probably know? from well, the I mean, help of American cool. movie, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And yeah, that yeah. intertwined fate of these two is, is, is right. special yeah. and interesting. Can I just say like, there's a, there's a flat of VHSs in some like garage somewhere in Wisconsin that we know. Like, hey, I want one of those. Like, I mean, Dude, after, right? after American movie, everybody wants, I, I would see those in video shelves for years. Those yeah. are always mm -hmm. the hipster, the video and SF and shit. But, um, you know what it just reminds me of is black devil doll from hell and like tales <laughs> from the Flathead zone. Mm -hmm. What I mean is like, um, Hell yeah. You know, those straight to video guys were out of their fucking minds because, mm -hmm. uh, like, there is no audience. There is no Tales of the Quad Dead audience in 1987. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because no. people would have just returned, they would have gotten angry and just returned it and, and said, I, I want to rent another movie. You know? like, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, you know what it is? It's, the, it's just about the last all American, like, carny hucksterism kind of landscape. Is the straight the to last video. American movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, or less, more or less. As far as material objects in your hands, but concerned. but like obviously, I think without the amplification of American movie, you know, it would have been a, a uphill not. uphill oh, no battle way. to sell well, look, a thirty-minute. There's a lot of Covens. There's a yeah. lot of Covens. Yeah. 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 I mean, well, it took Marx to uh, to agree to be the subject of a doc too, right? Because that's a lot of fucking work for him to put up with Chris and I was wondering yeah, about that. Sarah for like two years or whatever. Like a big know? distraction. So he must have it? known that was like a he must have had a marketing mind about that. Yeah, that's too, a good point. Know? It has value. And he seized yeah. every opportunity. Like Coven, I read that Coven played at the Egyptian theater, and like American movie didn't even play at the Egyptian at Sundance. What? Like yeah, like it was a huge thing. It sold, sold out crowd, and he brought VHSs. So you know, it is a stroke of it is an American dream that it is this stroke of good fortune that he's able to piggyback on the success of this movie that comes out well, of the, nowhere. The, the, well, but there was a guy happened. down the hall. Like yeah, it, exactly. it's so random. You know, it's like thank God there was a guy down the hall cut, cutting up his own movie. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. But knock on mm -hmm. the door because this is what that's one of the impressions I got was like there's so many covens out there you know what mm -hmm. I mean in, in the world that didn't get exposed maybe not as good or as good or better you know and they just like there's that movie The Jar <laughs> you guys heard of yeah. oh yeah, 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 yeah not to get yeah. sidetracked but just I think it's a prime example of like WTF like um and yeah it goes on forever and no one knows The Jar you know and it's, it didn't yeah. have American Jar, the movie. Yeah. American so, yeah. Jar. That'd be amazing. Thank God um, there is a movie that covered well, one of these movies. Joey, you know, the backstory. Joey, as the as you're becoming accustomed to the bleeding, dying clock, uh, is there, oh, is there anything? Me. I know. Is there anything else that you wanted to to, to talk? We didn't we didn't talk about Ken Keen, um, oh, but who's that? I, he's his dirty back friend of things, with the skullet. Ken, I could just say one piece on on Ken, but I think we should maybe uh, maybe brush on the on maybe the Ken? music the music yeah it. but Let's ken it. ken okay. keen is like his childhood best friend and if yeah. there's any guy in I don't, maybe you guys disagree but i just really don't like ken keen he's like the there's something guy. bad about ken keen there's oh something, can you describe him a little he has, blonde, skullet, right? he has a skullet mm -hmm. and he's like got a, he's always there filming with if the, Hooter, if, if, the hooters t-shirt no, no that's, that's his brother, brother. Yeah, okay, no, sorry. Uh, on, dude. Go ahead. Sort of teal colored shirt. Yeah, Absolutely, and he's got the yeah. ponytail and he's okay. bald on top with the ponytail. And the the one the mom says oh, is a bad influence. Yeah, bad yeah. influence. Yes, exactly. right, so what are you saying? Sorry. 
Um, yeah, just he's he's just an bad absolute news. bad seed. I think he's yeah. he's he's the real troublemaker of this whole crew between Mike and, <laughs> yeah. and, and Mark. I but side I with do the mom, love Joan. Yeah. I, one quick shout out to Joan, Mark's girlfriend. Yeah, I think she's a kind of unsung hero of this movie. Um, Can I do know, a shout out just real quick on supporting cast? Yeah. I'm a big fan of corny sophisticated like orson the, like the local orson wells <laughs> you know what i mean like every town has like the bloviating actor coven coven you know of course and, like, they so, found each always other always that bearded that bearded 58 year old guy who's, of course like, they found every each other single city in america you know so yeah. Yeah. shouts to that he guy can't even drop the theatrical thing like in the interview sections of the movie and he's like well yeah. you can call it coven if you want to be certainly here. not <laughs> like the yeah. acting it's like yeah. fucking who's that act who's that guy in i love it yeah it's acting so, the, <laughs> the, there's a weird Orson Welles. There's almost a micro nod to. I know that Mark is a huge Orson Welles fan, but it's interesting that the movie sort of structures itself, sort of playfully, like starting with this radio play, that, and then he's about yeah. to like launch into his movie. There's a bit of yep. like a Orson Wellesian trajectory there that's at least yeah. hinted at. And then you have this other character who's a bit of this like kind of, you know, almost Wellesian or thinks sure. of himself. Maybe that's you know? that's that's how I read him for. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. big shouts to him. Totally. Uh, uh, we gotta, Joey's got to talk music. Yeah. Well, I just, yeah. I, I'm, yeah. I, I mean, I think the music is incredible and it's amazing that he's able to get, I mean, it's made by, by, uh, Shank by Mike Shank. And yeah. it, you know, there's some really interesting stuff about the music. One is like, there seems to be a constant point of contention between Mark and Mike around the fact that his, song sounds exactly like, Black Sabbath. like a Black Sabbath song and he's <laughs> refusing to admit this. You just so changed there's... one word. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's I also just adorable. think that the, that. the music that. really pro is a kind of like I don't know, well, it almost reminds me of like a hurt song like there's like a quest yeah, like guitar. Man. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, you know, there's Prague, like a there, like 70s Prague. Well, no, he yeah. he uh he uh you cuz you have, you oh, know, yeah. Mike is playing on the guitar, he's playing He's playing Fight Fire with Fire by Metallica. That's a dan 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 And he's playing D by Randy Rose. or whatever, right? Yeah. Like doing acoustic. Yeah. Yeah. And and then he's playing D by Randy Rhodes, which is on the first Ozzy Osbourne solo album. That's yeah, the yeah. little Baroque, you know, classical piece that's played that a few times. Is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I always wondered, do they, they pay royalties for that shit? I don't I know. know. I know. I wonder that yeah. too. Yeah, I, I was like, I don't think so. Well, it's a cover, so. right? So they, they could just do the publishing. 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 But did they pay right. that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, you know, Michael, um, Michael Stipe. Or so, sorry to I interrupt right back to you in a second, but Michael Stipe was a principal investor. That's right. In this no shit. That's right. right. Like he did That's with Todd Solins, by the way. Oh, yeah. really? There you go. Wow. Sure, no, happiness. One, really? no one quite oh, understands the ways of the music supervisor, too. Sometimes they can like make sweet deals, you know, for... Uh... They can they can say I'm gonna pay you this much for this movie and for this one you're gonna cut me a deal and those mm -hmm. kind of things gonna happen right. Interesting. Well, okay, just yeah. what we have a few minutes left. Uh, real quick, I uh, just want to say one thing and then let's rattle off some of our favorite lines from the movie if you guys have any. I have a yeah. few, but um, <laughs> real real quick update on Mark Borchart. You know he's out there in the world on social media. Yeah, yeah. He finished a, a short documentary about a UFO convention that he narrated. Which was great. Uh, it was awesome. I got to see it, um, you know, with him in person, and it was really cool. So he's still making films and stuff and working on shit. Great. great. Um, so there's a cool little happy ending there. Um, all right. My favorite lines are: We got every f stop known to man in the film. We've got every f stop known to man in the film. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Love that. Uh, I'm gonna use that actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And. Um, when uh, again talking about those little idiosyncratic exchanges between Mike and Mark, this is probably one of my mm -hmm. favorites. Is when they're in the editing room, uh, at cutting the film at the end, and um, Mike points over to the cross and he's like, "It's a sign of voodoo, an unnatural cross." And then uh, Mark is like, "What do you think? When Christ was hanging there, he thought it was un he thought it was natural." <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, the it's definitely a sign of voodoo. Why is it a sign of voodoo? It's an unnatural cross, Mark. It's not like a. What do you think? When Jesus was hanging there, he thought it was natural? 
I, yeah, like, Amazing. what the hell are you guys talking about? Yeah. <laughs> so good. Anyone from uh, you guys? Kick what fucking you ass. I got a MasterCard. Oh, God. Kick fucking ass. I got a MasterCard. That's yeah. Oh, yeah. Silly, oh, yeah. That's yeah. an iconic well, title. Isn't that right before the title drop, yeah. too? It's like so yeah. iconic. <laughs> iconic. <laughs> well, I did, my, I did my Uncle Bill's. I mean, yeah. um... You know, this yeah. is like like I think one of my favorite moments is uh, you know take thirty seven on uh, <laughs> yeah. on his like ADR like you yeah. know, yeah. car and then yeah. I, and I was like when is he gonna say what I expected which is take thirty one so is that enough now no listen Bill. I ain't gonna do this anymore that's all for me goodbye okay uh, I'm done I'm done I'm, I'm done. not doing this anymore and uh, and then and yeah oh, and then, he's, and then my favorite movie. line is. This is for the birds. Yeah. You know, just, <laughs> yeah. that before, but that's, that's it's such a great payoff when you see him deliver that line in the, in COVID. I know. Oh, like, thank like, God for everyone's sake. Yeah. It's all right. It's okay. There's something to live for. Jesus told me so. Thank yeah. God. That's a thank big moment for me. That's it. It is. Yeah. It my is, all it is. time, my all time favorite line, which is probably I feel like. I almost think everyone knows this one, but aesthetically, I'm not ready. Aesthetically, I'm not ready. Yeah, of course. Is like, there's such a poetry <laughs> there. There you is, know, yeah. And it's something yeah. I've said to myself <laughs> before shooting anything, you know? Yeah, that's um, great. Go ahead. Or, uh, idle hands are known to be the devil's workshop. Yes. Right. <laughs> it's yes. Just over, yes. It's like putting two together. And then I also have uh, <laughs> down... Um, Last night I was so drunk I called Morocco. Oh! Last night, man, I was so drunk I was calling Morocco, man. Calling, trying to get to the Hotel Hilton at Tangiers in Casablanca, man. That's, I mean, that's, that's pathetic, man. Is that what you want to do with your life? Suck down peppermint schnapps and try to call Morocco at two in the morning? Thank you for yeah, reminding me. What was he that. saying? Well, is he that like a euphemism? About, no, he was talking what, about what like saying? when he's talking about Backers? Northwestern. There's a scene where it's amazing sh two shot where they're at the they're at the junkyard. And they're talking right. about, and he's like, yeah, talking about how directionless. He's always ranting about the American dream and everything. And he's talking about, sure. well, what I was doing last night was uh, I was drunk phoning, you know, the Tangiers in Morocco, you know. And he's like, that's not what I want to be <laughs> doing. You know, it's like, that's what he's yeah. really prank phone calling the yeah. Tangiers in Morocco. That's insane. Um, and the, the only American one dream thing, just Uncle Bill's final speech, too, you know, about oh, like, oh. what's yeah. yeah. it Great doing poetry. Yeah, I can't in quote any of it. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> last one. Last last one. Give me one more. Is of course when they're putting dude's head through the fucking you know uh, yes cabinet <laughs> the cabinet but, door. But yeah. then yeah. but then after that when you see Mark directing pan down twitching fingers get the oh, twitching, yeah, fingers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. twitching fingers nerves twitching please fingers just the fingers just the fingers just the fingers man. Before Twitch, it rolls heart, out, get heart, it before it rolls out. Whole, heart, yeah. heart, heart pulse. Yeah, that's heart pound, heart pound, heart pound. Yeah. All right, we needed three fucking hours for that one. <clears throat> it's great. Yeah, yeah that was fun, and uh, was you know, great. welcome Joy to the fold here. Yeah, you know, pleasure yeah. to have you, and maybe we'll do yeah. another one it's down the road. You know, yeah, yeah. Throw some titles at us. You know, that, yeah, that's fun as hell. Yeah, but, uh, only, a, only yeah. titles only titles with the word american with american yeah. yeah i got more yeah we're doing all oh, things american God. pie 2 yeah, <laughs> yeah. american yeah. me you can do that if you want um Ooh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right well that was uh one fucking hour on american movie uh Great. obviously so much there to talk about um we didn't get a chance to um get into really the specifics of the deleted scenes but i'm, I'm calling it right now that uh, i'm going to string my two favorite deleted scenes from the movie that's going to be our moment of zen oh, because they <laughs> are the best thing ever it i'm just going to set it up real quick it's 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 mark uh uh ordering fast food from the burger king which is one of the greatest moments in recorded history and then oh. by next is uh, you're going to see Mike Shank uh, during when I think their car is stalled or they're waiting for someone to pick them up. And uh, Mike Shank is musing on what he would rather be doing than being outside Ooh. stuck in the winter, to which his reply is, well, you'll see it. Um, and uh, right. it's, it's, it's choice, choice material. So th those will be our moments. Um, Joey, 
it was a pleasure to have you here on the show. Uh, thanks for being a super fan. Um, I know your parents are really excited that you've been here, and yeah. we're gonna we're <laughs> yeah. really keep, pulling keep for you, up, man. Kid. Yeah, we're definitely yeah, yeah, pulling I finally for made you. it to Hollywood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the right, big right. time. Yeah. So, yeah. real quick before we let you go, man. Um, next yeah. week, uh, next week, unfortunately or fortunately, follows on my birthday week. So it is the I know what that means. Third birthday oh. episode uh, here on one fucking hour. Yeah. <sighs> should I unveil it or should I? I like the mystery because we're saying something's coming, but just not the title. Okay. Okay. It's a special episode. Something it's a special. Is coming. Something's coming. coming. Something about Mary. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, what's this something's got to give? Something's got to give. Um, no, um, okay, so this I is watched what that. That's so weird. I watched a weird do- ass documentary on that on YouTube, like on yesterday. something's got to give. Really? On Marilyn Monroe's unfinished final oh. movie. Yes. Oh no, no, he's talking. <laughs> I'm talking about, Jack uh, Nicholson and uh, Jack Danky. and Diane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's like Jack Hamilton? Reeves? In the Hamptons, yeah. yeah. Um, no, no, yeah. no. And it's. I thought you were saying, Marcus, like, yeah, I watched this, like two yeah. hour doc all about like Nicholson on the set with Diane I Keaton. I know, me too. Two thousand four. <laughs> That's really sick. That's Ooh, way sicker than that. Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. It is. Oh, I want right. to see that. I was like, shit. Maybe we should yeah, do that. I'll sign me up. Um, yeah. Anyway, but I, I, I have a very personal pick uh, that I'm mulling over. I think it's what I'm going to go with. But um, this is a nice little. I'm going to turn this into a plug, okay? Because if you're you not following us, that. I do. But I'm just going to say, if you're not following us on Instagram at one fucking hour or on Twitter at numerical one fucking hour, um, uh, that's where I'll, I'll drop the big fat announce of what the birthday episode is going to be. So tune nice. in to that so that when gives you enough. Uh, in the next few days. Uh, so okay. so then you guys will have enough time to guess. react uh, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. People guess if you know me, so guess if you don't know me, guess let's figure it out. <laughs> but also uh, tune in, subscribe to the social channels. Cause you'll definitely want to get a pre-watch in when you see this fucking right. insane movie that we're going to do. You, you know what you're picked. Okay. I do. That's, that's I it. do. But yeah, follow us to get the, to get the word. Um, so anyway, Joey, any uh, closing thoughts or feelings or emotions? Just that we're in America today. And we are ready to roll. So okay. Let's go. okay. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, everybody. Have Amen. a great have a great rest of your week. And we will see you next week uh, for another one fucking hour. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah, I was always going to McDonald's and getting like Big Macs and that. And then I found out for real that the Whopper was flame broiled, man, and that was good as hell. So I never went to Burger King because of. How you doing? Fine, how you guys doing? Okay, very good, sir. Um, then because Burger King used to sell Pepsi, man. Fuck that. But. Okay, very cool. And uh, put that right there. And. Uh, okay. Oh, that's cool. And anyway, so man, when I when I tasted that Whopper and it was char broiled, it was good as hell. And then coincidentally. Burger King started selling Coke, so the whole thing got wrapped up. Now you can go to Burger King, get a Whopper, and get the goddamn Coke, and you're set. But that whole Pepsi thing just turned me off from Burger King. And uh, so, I mean, it's great that things work out sometimes like that. We were supposed to do the woods attack today, and uh, we went, uh, people didn't show up, so I went to go get Brian Stadola, right? And then on the way back, coming right up over here, the, the beautiful ass my mom's running car stops. Just like that, man. So the people dropped out, we started to fill in the gaps, my mom was gonna come, we got Brian, and then we made it right here, man, and here we fucking sit now, you know? What's the plan now? What's the plan now? The, thank God we parked in a Saturday Sunday parking zone, man, <laughs> where we can park here. Plan now probably is to fucking go back home and then. Sometimes I wish I was a member of ACDC. How come? <laughs> <laughs>
because then I probably wouldn't be standing out here outside, you know, stuck, you know. <laughs> be in a, in a mansion playing my guitar or maybe in some other country on stage or something instead I'm standing here out in the snow. Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs> Wicked, man.